in 65, I bought a new Gibson banjo. I was playing with a band, at the staff, we was playing staff band at Bean Blossom. And I met a guy over there that lived in Indianapolis that told me he could take it and make it sound better. And uh, when I got it back, I tore it apart to see what he had done to it. And so <laughs> then uh, I got better acquainted with him. And at that time, he was doing work for Earl Scruggs and J.D. and some people like that. And through him, I met Ralph and met Earl and met J.D. and, and a lot of the, the top banjo players. And then I started to do started doing the next like he was doing, and, and I would get most of the material from him and buy the fingerboard from him, and it already inlaid, so I kept doing a little more and a little more of it till finally I got started doing all of it. And uh, in uh, 75, uh, I asked Ralph about building him a banjo. and, and uh, Ralph Stanley. Ralph Stanley. And so I built him one, and he called me a couple of months later and said, if you'll build these, he said, we call them the Stanley Tones, he said, I'll sell them. And I started doing them in 75. And then within a couple of years, I had I was working second shift in a factory. So I, I had he was selling so many that I couldn't keep them built. And, and I moved back down here in Kentucky and, and uh, started doing it full time in March of 80. We've done banjos for Raymond Fairchild. We've done them for uh, Sonny Osborne, Ralph Stanley. And we've done a few for J.D. And uh, then we do a little Roy Lewis banjo, and uh, it keeps us busy. Keeps the two of us busy. The two of us, your son, Me, my son, and myself. Yes. How 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 did he get started? Did it? Start? Uh, whenever he was small, he was real small. Whenever I bought the first banjo, what's his name again? Ricky, yeah. and he just he grew up with it, and then he wanted to try his luck at something else. So he went and worked. Uh, in Tennessee for a while and come back here and work for a while and then he decided to do this and he's been with me now about 15 years then then I started him cutting the inlay and he likes doing that and he cuts all the inlay work does all that and does most of the finishing work this this is a, a Frank Neat yeah it's just a, a one we built up special it's just a special one this is the only one we've done like this oh really okay. yeah it's got the gold mother of pearl and it instead of the white, and then it's got some abalone pearl in it. And then we put, uh, we even put the gold, uh, you can get any more, you can get gold frets, and we put the gold fret in this. You can't get them anymore? You can get them, yeah. Oh, you can get, you can get them. them, yeah. They're harder to work with. But we put those in this one. We built this one up special because, you know, we just wanted to do something that, that nobody else had done, and that's what we did. The, the way that it, all of it is fit together, and then this, this inlay work, you know, it takes, I think it takes an artist to do this inlay. Mm -hmm. It, uh, you know, the like that is up there with her name on it and all that, you see. Yeah. I think that it's, it's, that's an art to that. And when you do it by hand, and that's the way that Ricky does it, he cuts it all by hand. Back whenever I first started doing them, it made you feel good when you seen somebody on the opera playing one of yours or something like that. But it's something you get used to. And, uh, could you see it on TV? The word neat. You could see them. Yeah, I've seen them like that. And then I've even had, uh, I've, I've had uh, people to mention on the Opry that they were playing one of mine. 